look, the size, the wrap, I smell money. The son of four black sharecroppers, he and his partner River Phoenix broke the wrestling business wide open in 1996 with the NWO invasion of WCW, a storyline loosely patterned on the Battle of Bunker Hill, except with more brats. Now splitting time between managing boy bands for Island Records and working for total non-stop action wrestling, he is on a nationwide search for his first ever female valet. He made me what I am today. Let's welcome pro wrestling legend Kevin Nash. So, Kevin, tell us all about yoga for regular guys. Mark, turn that music down. I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, cut the music. Kevin, tell us all about yoga for regular guys. Uh, <laughs> yoga for regular guys, that's a workout for guys that don't actually want to pump iron. Why now? Why a female valet? Why did it take all these years? Well, you know, when you're 50 years old and everybody says to you, man, you know, I want to get you something for your 50th birthday, you're like, you know, dude, I got everything I want. If I wanted something, I could buy it. And I said, you know, what? one thing I don't have is like a, a really hot girl of my choice to hang out with at TV and walk down the ring with me. So I said, you know what, this could be, a, this could be something. So, uh... And you know I've always had, you know, a thing for the the, the female uh, persuasion. Yeah, I, I noticed that over the six or seven years we worked together, you didn't have to be persuaded too hard, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So what qualifications are you looking for? A wholesome all-American, a low-down dirty whore? Tell us what you want. You know, I actually thought about it, and I'm looking for, like, a, a 2010 version of Miss Elizabeth. Classy dame, huh? Yeah, I want I want somebody classy because I'm starting to get into that uh, that Clooney era of my career. After you know, fifty but... years, <laughs> do you mean Rosemary Clooney or George Clooney? Rosemary. That, that's what I figured. What will the valet be required to do? And please keep it clean. Um, I just look. I mean, I, I want somebody that when, when, when you turn on the TV, you just go, oh. You know, I want I want somebody that, that when you look at me, you go, man, I, I could actually take that girl to Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I, I, I go, oh, when the Dudleys come on, but it's for a totally different reason. <laughs> how, how, how can prospective valets get in touch? What is this search going to entail? How can they meet you, Kevin Nash, and hawk their wares, as it were? Well, I mean, the easiest way to do it is, is uh, you know, the applicant's got to uh, email a photo of themselves and uh, explain why they deserve to be my valet for the night. Uh, preferably, the, you know, the essay should be no more than, than 50 words, but we will allow up to 69 words. And uh, applications must send their emails to BigSexyTour at TNAWrestling.com. There you have it, girls, BigSexyTour at TNAWrestling.com. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the less clothes worn in the picture, the better. I mean, it never hurts to get me really, you know, I mean, just because, you know, I'm, I'm going through these applications and, you know, something that does catch the eye is, is you know, is, 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 is going to have a better chance than, say, somebody in a, a burqa. You mentioned Miss Elizabeth. Who set the standards besides her when it came to female valets in wrestling? Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. I mean, for, for for beauty and class, I mean, I think she was she she kind of uh, uh, but I mean, I you know, I can't fault Stacy Keebler in any form or fashion. Well, actually, I could fault her because she wouldn't sleep with the guys. Yeah, but I'll speak for yourself. No, um, <laughs> what the? Did I say that, honey? We, you're not listening, are you? We'll catch it in post production. Don't worry about it. <laughs> No, uh, Stacy was. I thought Stacy was uh, was was good. Well, the wholesome all American type, to be sure. I mean, too many of them just slap on the silicone and do weird makeup and think they can trot out there on TV. Correct? Well, I, and, and how many people can you know gyrate the, their buttocks on the second rope? I mean, it's just like really everybody does the same thing. I well, kind of like the one the one that was was there. For, I don't know if she's still there in, in, in the WWE that did did, did the. She was like the Latin girl that did that kind of thing underneath the bottom row. Oh, the split Molina. Yeah, I like her. Yeah, I, th I thought that was kind of, you know, 
The only thing missing was for them to drop a pole in the middle of the ring and let her finish her act. But Well, I think a pole got dropped later, but it had nothing to do with finishing her act. Uh, you never know. <laughs> now, as you mentioned, you're 50. And TNA Wrestling Note, no offense to them, but why not go to New York, WWE, and finish up with Shawn Michaels? He's going to the last year of his career. Diesel and HBK together again. What do you think? Um, you know, I, I'm actually going to talk to Sean. I haven't talked to Sean in a while, and uh, we haven't uh, we haven't talked in about two or three weeks. And if this is his last year, if he's if he's really serious about this being his last year, then you know, then I've often uh, I've often said that you know, I, there's a kind of a, uh, a full circle in life, and you know, for me to to my career started when I stood behind Shawn Michaels and, and raised my fist with a, I would say, one of the worst hockey mullet uh, haircuts of all time. Yeah, but I think you borrowed it from Ryan Smith. He wants it back. Yeah, but I don't think it was as bad as a Kentucky waterfall that Shawn had going at that particular time. I think he put Joe Dirt to shame. But uh, I think that, you know, I mean, that, you know, if I had to, because I've got a picture of Sean and I when we first broke in. It was a it was a cover shot of a of a magazine, like during my first year in New York. And uh, I would like to have you know a picture, you know, twenty years later, of the uh, aged Sean Michael and the and the aged Diesel, and kind of make that uh, you know the the the, the circle uh, complete. So I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't even know how my deal. I know, I know my deal's up in October. I don't know if they have an option. We have options. We both have options. I don't even remember how it goes. But, Perhaps you uh, could just reinstitute the Halloween Havoc pay per view and re debut as Oz. Well, you know, it's not like that wasn't money. I think that the only way that would really work is to, if, if I could find Van Hammer and bring him back in. Maybe maybe him and Todd Champion in the three-way dance. Perhaps Firebreaker Chip. Now, now, for those who don't know, Kevin played scholarship basketball at the University of Tennessee. There is a video out there of him blocking Michael Jordan. Yes, that's right, that Michael Jordan. Pinning him on the backboard, as I recall. And now you're back in basketball shape. Talk about that. What do you weigh right now? It looks like you sold all your PEDs to David Ortiz. I actually I weighed two eighty two. I played my I played my junior year. I actually played in Europe at two ninety. So I'm eight pounds lighter than I, than basically when I when I was playing ball. You got to feel great. I mean, I, I'm not trying to you know blow sunshine, but I mean in the ring you look fleeter than you haven't quite some time. Not yeah, fleet, but fleeter. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's it, it's the equivalent of taking a forty pound rucksack off your back. I mean. You don't, you know, you you, you kind of have this mentality that you you want to have that big bulky football offensive lineman look to you, and uh, you know when I trimmed down, I lost I lost over four inches off my waist, and my shoulder, you know, it, just, it wasn't like my shoulder width changed any, so it gave the perception that I was much bigger than I was, and you know I actually uh, you know had. Uh, one of the guys from uh, one of the dirt sheets, Mitchell, saying, you know, that this Nash, this massively jacked up 50-year-old, and I'm thinking, dude, I'm 40 pounds lighter than I was two years ago. How massively jacked up am I? Talk but, about your uh, movie career. A lot of people are unaware that you've been in a lot of pictures. I think most people remember you in the remake of The Longest Yard. What was your favorite movie to work on, and what do you have in the fire now? Uh, you know, Longest Yard would probably be would would be my favorite because I was I was more so featured in that than any other. I just had a debacle uh, of a uh, we, 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 I shot a uh, an indie horror film out in the desert of Taft, California, and uh, shot for about eight days out there. It was called Rachel's Return, and uh, the producer director went insane, ran off the crew, ran off a second crew. Of course, you know, me being me, I decided to call a SAG representative. SAG representative came out to the set, looked at it, and basically shut the film down. So once again, <laughs> Kevin Nash prevailed. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to Kevin Nash of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling here on 105.9 The X. With all due respect to your days as Diesel and WWE World Champion, 
Was the NWO invasion of WCW the best time of your career? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you know, it just, it just, and from a party standpoint, because, you know, Hogan and Mach had, had so much stroke, uh, you know, and, and, and there was always, you know, we always kept the beer in Hogan's locker room. So, you know, there was always, you know, three or four cases of Miller Light on ice. And, you know, we would occasionally, I mean, not all the time, but occasionally have one or two before the show started just to kind of calm our nerves because it was live TV. And uh, Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing was, I can never remember a, a better, like, every every guy that from, 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 the, from the lighting guys to the announce teams to the boys, everybody went to the bar that night drank until Nitro came back on the replay. We'd watch the replay together like as a co- collective unit. I mean, we shut the bar down at like 4 o'clock. I, like, it, and, and the bars never minded because I think they made like $150,000, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just I, I can never remember it, like getting up on a Monday flying to Nitro going, oh, this is this is horrible. Well, what what made it work? Because I've often said in terms of crowd response, that was the closest pro wrestling ever came to real sport because people chose up sides. It wasn't Absolutely. just good versus bad. It was kind of cool versus the system, and everybody had a different opinion, a different viewpoint on who they wanted to see triumph. Right. And, it, and I think there was so much, um, you know... <sighs> Two things sell in, 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 in this in this in, in this world, and that's, that's sex and violence. And we were and, and we were very violent. We had aluminum baseball bats, and people knew we had. You know, people had never done things like that. Now people have sledgehammers and this and that, but before then it was always just fists. And when guys came down with aluminum baseball bats and, and a guy ducked and, and hit the pole and you knew it was a aluminum baseball bat and then the guy behind him hit the guy and, you know, hit, hit the guy with a solid shot across the shoulders, they were like, holy, this is, this is not fake wrestling. This is, these guys are thugs. And I think that, you know, though we had, you know, Hollywood gimmick bats that we actually hit the people with, they didn't know that at the time. And, uh, I mean, we just, we, you know, we basically took the boom mic, took it out of the shot and for, for, for that, you know, that, sh- that short period of time, whether it be a year and a half or two years, we actually got some believability into what we were doing. The characters were, were you know, and, and we had somebody booking the territory, Kevin Sullivan, who believed in booking heat that really let, you know, the, the bad guys really, you know, basically almost take over the company, and then they, you know, the, the, the company, you know, slowly made a rebound with Sting and, and uh, you know, pushed us kind of back a little bit. Now, when Hogan joined the NWO and turned bad, it was a monumental moment, and certainly it, it got the NWO over super heels and an entity to be reckoned with. But in the long run, did that guarantee its demise? Because a guy like that, and hey, God love him, he's made more money than anybody, but he's always going to get his own way. And I'm not sure the NWO needed to be under anybody's creative thumb except the guys who started it. Well, I, I always said to me, to me like, that, that, that what killed the NWO was when it split and there was the Wolf Pack and there was, and there was the NWO black and white, when they took Scott and put him on their side, it was like, really? You know, like, if, if Scott would have been with us, and it would have been like me, Scott, Lex, and Sting, and Conan, and Mach would have stayed. You know, Mach would have stayed with 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 Hogan. You know, it was like the it was like you know basically the uh, it was the Confederate War, and and the blue and the gray. You know, just never fought. They just they went to Gettysburg and they just kind of threw barbs at each other, but they just you know they never. <laughs> fired, fired and and when they split or, in the first place, for some reason, Connecticut joined the South. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know. It was just uh, when that didn't happen, you know, when when, when the when the line was drawn and that never happened because they're too cool, brother. You know, it was like whatever. I don't think it's a secret that uh, there have been some changes made backstage at TNA, and when you and I worked together, you always had a very creative mind. I think you did a very good job in your turn as Booker with WCW. Why not run TNA? 
Well, I just, um, at age 50, you know, I look at it and I say that, you know, it would it would take, uh, you know, I, mean, I know how much time Vince Russo puts into, in, into what he does. And, you know, I look at my life, I say, I have a 13-year-old kid that's, you know, he's dating and he's, you know, I mean, he's, Isn't he you know, dating Stacy Keebler? But yeah, he, he's dating Stacy Keebler. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I got a thirteen-year-old kid that just right now. You know, I look at it and I say, you know, I've had my time, um, and my son needs a father more than TNA needs me creatively. So that's kind of where I, you know, I, I told you know, I told everybody that was involved that if anybody wanted to run an idea by me or use me as a sounding board or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to help. But as far as, you know, I actually think Vince Russo does a very good job. I know a lot of people are, are, are critical of, of what he does. But right now I think Vince has, you know, kind of a clean palate that this is going to be Vince's show for a while. And I think people will be surprised, you know, that, you know, I think he has a lot different uh, outlook than than even Jeff and Dutch had. I, you know, I, I still think that Jeff and Dutch have a little bit more of an old school mentality. And I think Vince is, you know, because Vince does have kids that are in our target, target demographic, Vince realizes that, you know, as much as, you know, the the the, um, the, the dirt sheet guys want to see a 35-segment uh, wrestling match, most people don't. Most people want to see the beautiful women out there in brown panties. So I think that there's got to be kind of a, it's almost like a variety show. You've got to kind of have something for everybody, and you've got to kind of make a segment stand on its own and then, you know, ho- hopefully hold that audience during the commercial break to see what the next segment's going to bring. Because if you say, we'll be right back to this match, then you go, okay, well, they're going to come back to the match. Let me see what's on. Oh, my God, look what's on this channel. And next thing you know, you go, what was I watching? <laughs> Before we let you go, since this is marginally a sports show, will the Steelers repeat this year? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's so difficult to repeat in that, in, in that league because, you know. It's designed to not repeat. Absolutely. I mean, you, you know, you, you lose you lose one, one, one key, um, you know, one key. You know, you lose Ben, and you're done. Right. You're one injury away from being 500. Absolutely. And it's just, you know, it. it, it if anything, basketball is probably would 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 probably be the easiest sport to repeat in because there's 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 five guys and then the, you know the sixth and seventh guy are pretty close to. I mean, you look at the the Rockets; they they lose uh, Yao Ming and and McGrady and still make a run. You know, the, the basketball talent is, is so you know I think the parity in, in basketball is probably you know probably closer than anything else. Well, plus they could always bring you back. Well, they could bring. I think I, I, I've got. If, as long as I, I mean, as long as the team that brings me back pays my fines, I think that those six hard fouls that I give could really be a game changer. Dude, you punched your own coach in the face at Tennessee. They ain't bringing you back. It was. It was more of an open end smack. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, thank you for joining us, man. We'll talk soon. Love you, buddy. That's Kevin Nash. I'm Mark Madden, 105.9 The X.